Behind me is the National War College, um, as it's known uh, in the present day. It's in Washington, D.C., but it was originally the U.S. Army War College created in 1904 and in essence represents a kind of a culmination point uh, in the military reform movements of the latter part of the 19th uh, century. The Naval War College actually precedes the creation of this one, but uh, the creation of the Army War College and everything that it pretended was really more of an uphill struggle than for the Navy, hence using it as the, the Zoom uh, backdrop. Let me share the, uh, uh, the PowerPoint slides for this portion of the, this week's lecture. And let me back up. Okay, here are uh, the terms. And then these are the learning objectives. Uh, by the end of this presentation, you should understand, first of all, Emory Upton, um, who was a uh, Civil War uh, soldier, first a colonel and, uh, and ultimately a general. Um, sort of traumatized by what he viewed as the needless carnage of the, the Civil War. And this gave impetus to a passion on his part uh, for reforms uh, to the US Army after the American Civil War. These reforms uh, failed to gain traction uh, in the short run, but they set the agenda uh, for future reforms. And in that sense are, uh, are highly influential. Second, the rise of the National Guard and the continued importance of the dual manpower uh, traditional. Rationally, this dual manpower traditional sort of made less and less sense, um, but the, the volunteer tradition uh, in the United States was so strong uh, as to be impervious um, uh, to change. And we still have the National Guard uh, today, which plays a major, uh, major role in, uh, um, in American operations, both foreign and domestic. Third, the motives for post-war naval reform, and this is sort of a big success story um, in the latter part of the 19th century. If military reform struggled during this period, naval reforms really came on strong. Next, the Endicott Board and the revision of coastal defense structures. We're not going to deal too heavily with this, but you need to know something about it. Then, and this is huge, the ideas of Alfred Thayer Mahan and sea power. Mahan can be seen as a counterpart to Emory Upton, but unlike Upton, who during his lifetime uh, met with frustration and failure in his own attempts at reform, thought, um, Alfred Thayer Mahan saw the triumph of his ideas of sea power, not just in the United States, but actually in uh, the navies of Europe uh, and of, of Japan. And then finally, uh, the basic information about the birth of the modern uh, U.S. Navy, and this comes into being around about 1890 or so. First of all, uh, Emory Upton and Uptonianism, that's sort of the ideology associated with him. This is uh, Upton himself, born 1838, died 1881, relatively young, graduated from West Point, class of 1861, went straight into, uh, into the American Civil War. Unlike uh, a lot of uh, uh, of high-ranking officers, both volunteer officers and supposedly professional officers, uh, Upton was e extraordinarily uh, adept at operational art. And probably the most famous single thing he did was at the Battle of Spotsylvania, in which he organized very carefully a tactical charge against well-manned Confederate fortifications uh, and by, I'm not gonna go into the details of this, but by the adroit units of uh, the regiments composing his brigade and giving each one a specific uh, assignment, managed to breach uh, the Confederate entrenchments and was really, was repelled only by the fact that no other Union troops came up to, uh, to support his brigade, thereby forcing it, uh, forcing it back. After the, uh, uh, the American Civil War, uh, Upton gained the patronage of uh, uh, William T. Sherman, of course, the famous Civil War general who went on to become the general in chief, the commanding general of the uh, of the U.S. Army. 
uh, Upton, or sorry, Sherman knew about uh, Upton's interest in military reforms and sent him on a round the world uh, tour uh, in the 1870s uh, that resulted in the 1878 publication of a book called The Armies of Asia and, uh, and Europe. And it's a survey of, of armed forces the world over, but the center point of it was the German army, which, had been, which was recently created out of primarily the Prussian uh, army. Prussia was sort of the, the most important uh, German kingdom in what became, as of 1871, uh, a unified country of German uh, that came from most other uh, German kingdoms and principalities. Just about everything except Austria-Hungary now became uh, Germany. And what was, what was fascinating about the German army was just how good it was. Up until 1870, everybody thought, oh, the best, best army in the world, the model for us to emulate is the French army. Well, uh, France and Prussia with certain German allies went to war against one another in July of 1870. And within a few weeks, uh, the Prussian army surrounded and destroyed one French army and by October 1870 uh, surrounded uh, and destroyed the second major French army. The war continued as, uh, as uh, uh, the French created a, a republic to replace the uh, essential dictatorship of uh, the Emperor Napoleon III, they tried to, uh, to fight on against uh, the Germans, actually using the same model as during the American Civil War of, you know, of just sort of mass volunteer enlistments, got nowhere. And so Upton viewed uh, this army as, you know, as the army to emulate. And if you look at the bottom uh, left uh, illustration, what you'll see are, these are Prussian staff officers. And these are special kinds of staff officers because they worked directly for uh, the Prussian or German um, chief of staff. And the chief of staff ran the Prussian, later German, German army, sort of the brains of that army. But these, these staff officers were in effect the nervous system uh, of that army. So. If, um, uh, if the general in chief is the uh, uh, the chief of staff is the is the brains, it, it is the these staff officers who transmit uh, the commander's intent uh, to subordinate units and make sure that subordinate uh, commanders and we're talking about generals, you know, did what the chief of staff wanted. These staff officers were colonels. They were they were outranked by these generals, but whenever they turned up and basically said, you're not doing it right. This is what the chief of staff wants you to do, make it happen. Um, these generals understood that these lower ranking officers were speaking with the voice of the, uh, the chief of staff and needed to be obeyed. That made a big impression uh, on Upton. Something else that made a big impression on Upton was the, uh, the, the German conscription system, which uh, he thought that the United States should adopt the professionalism uh, of it and the fact that the German officer corps was built upon uh, schools of, uh, of advanced uh, instruction. All of this stuff made a major impression on, uh, on Upton. During this period of time, Upton wrote a manuscript called The Military Policy of the United States. And there were more, there, and it was never published. It wasn't published until 1904, but it kind of circulated among the American officer corps uh, informally. Uh, and, and, and caught the attention um, of some American officers who agreed with it uh, and thought, you know, this, this portends the direction in which uh, the American army ought to, uh, ought to go. Here are the main themes of what became known as Uptonianism. The main theme is this dual army tradition, manpower tradition, volunteers and so forth, forget about it. Um, and the military policy of the United States is basically one long harangue against volunteer soldiers with a sort of a compendium of every way in which the uh, uh, American mil militia forces had sort of screwed up uh, over the decades. So he was thinking in terms of reliance on a regular army. Now, he didn't believe in a large peacetime army. He understood that that was, uh, that that was a non-starter, 
back in 1820, Secretary of War John C. Calhoun, decades before, had come up with the idea of creating what was called an expansible army. And this expansible army was, in peacetime, was very heavy on officers and very heavy on non-commissioned officers. These were the ones who needed to be the most professional. These were the ones who needed to be the best trained. And in wartime, you could take the comparatively small force of enlisted men and infuse that very rapidly with volunteer troops to be sure, but who would be trained to up to the standard of a regular army and would function under the leadership of regular army officers and regular army NCOs. This was a primary um, component of the Uptonian vision. Then he wanted a general staff on the Prussian or German model, if you like. The rotation of, of officers between staff and line. Now, this might sound a little bit arcane, but here's the deal. In the, in the, uh, during this period, if you became an officer, you had sort of two routes to go. You'd be a staff officer, and the whole time of your career, you would be responsible for supply or quartermaster stuff or this kind of a, you know, this kind of a thing. And you never, and you, in effect, operated in opposition to line officers. And these were the ones who actually commanded troops uh, operationally and so forth. The line officers would ask the staff officers, hey, we need this in the way of supplies and, uh, and equipment and so forth. Let us have it. And the staff officers were responsible for saying, not so fast. You know, we need to conserve these supplies and so forth. And you can only get so much, not everything that, that, that you want. And one of the reasons that staff officers had this kind of idea was because they didn't know what it was like to be a line officer. And one of the reasons why line officers got so, so frustrated with staff officers is because they never understood that staff officers were up against you know, serious limitations. They weren't just being jerks. You know, they had to operate within the limits of the resources that were available to them. Upton argued by switching back and forth between staff and line, officers would have experience with both kinds of, uh, of work um, in, in the military and would be that much more efficient uh, and effective uh, as a result. And then, by the way, this, um, this eventually came to pass. And to this day, American officers rotate routinely between staff and line. That's just the way it goes. Um, the next thing was to build a more professional officer corps through first advanced schools. Um, and it was during this period that a command and general staff college was, was, was created at Fort Leavenworth. And then he, he wanted to have something like the Kriegs Academy, the German Kriegs Academy that eventually took form in, um, in the guise of the U.S. Army War College long after his death. He opposed the idea of simple seniority as the criteria for promotion and, and, and favored uh, examination for promotion. In other words, you know, before you get to be promoted, let's test you to make sure you know your stuff. Common sense to us now, but a real novelty uh, back then. And then ongoing efficiency reports, you know, annual reports on just how good a given officer was. Nowadays, these are taken for granted. In the latter part of the 19th century, these were still a novelty. And then rapid lineal pr promotion, up or out, so that you weren't, so that, you know, the young officers of promise, you know, weren't sort of stuck at the rank of lieutenant or captain for years, sometimes even decades on end, while these antiquated um, higher ranking officers, you know, held these higher ranks by dint of the fact that they simply didn't die. Uh, and remained in the, uh, in the military. Again, this seems like common sense to us, but it was very novel at the time. So you can see how forward thinking Upton's re proposed um, reforms were. Well, most of his proposals failed. Some of them went before Congress and were debated and so forth, but ultimately nixed. And one, one reason for this is because the reliance on the regular army and certain other components of Uptonianism simply ran counter to American political culture uh, and to the idea of democracy and to the idea that um, ordinary Americans, you know, sort of ordinary leaders, business leaders, community leaders, and so forth, had what it took to be military leaders by dint of the fact that they were good leaders in civilian life. So 
So what did happen during the military reform period associated uh, with Upton? Well, you see the rise of military journals to talk about military ideas and institutions uh, also to discuss uh, military affairs and how to improve things and so forth. Schools like the, uh, the Command and General Staff College get created, and then lyceums. And lyceums happen in regular units. And these were kind of symposia in which periodically the officers would get together to discuss some kind of military uh, theme. Now, not everybody kind of understood what was going on here. Sherman himself thought that one thing that officers should learn how to do is to, is to, is to come up with legible handwriting. That was a big deal to him. Um, not a bad idea to have leg legible handwriting, nevertheless, not exactly a critical skill for, uh, for making uh, war. Another subject was uh, fire control. And fire control has to do with you know, discipline in terms of you know, firing rifles and so forth. But certain officers had never heard of this. One officer who had to do a presentation on fire control did this whole spiel on fire drills and what to happen if a fire broke out in a barracks and so on. So, you know, baby steps. It came along, um, you know, slowly but surely. And Upton's aspirations, though, set the agenda for the future and were finally realized uh, by the Secretary of War shown in this photograph here, Ella Huru, who was a New York lawyer um, who became um, Secretary of War first under William McKinley and then after his assassination under President Theodore Roosevelt. Uh, Root understood um, Upto Up Uptonian reforms because they meshed with an emerging um, ideology called progressivism. And this has nothing to do with modern progressivism when we talk about sort of, you know, the, the so-called radical, you know, liberal left and, and so forth. That's not, you know, that's not the kind of progressivism that we're talk talking about. This was a bipartisan uh, view of how to organize American uh, society and American government. There were Democratic pro progressives and Republican progressives. Root was a Republican uh, progressive. And the idea was, hey, look, we've got large corporations now. These are billion dollar corporations. The first one was the railroads, but now you've got steel, oil, meat packing, all kinds of other industries. And these require complex administration. And it's just insane to think that corporations require complex administration, but governance doesn't. And so they espouse the creation of what's been called the administrative state. And one attribute of the administrative state among many would be, for instance, the creation of the Food and Drug Administration to make sure that the food that Americans got to eat wasn't like, you know, going to make them sick. Uh, which was a definite uh, possibility uh, before the FDA was created in 19, 1906. So within this frame of an administrative state, the idea of a more administratively coherent and efficiently military made intuitive sense to Elihu Root and people like him because Root wasn't able to make these reforms, reforms ultimately happen by himself. He was able to persuade other like-minded policy makers and opinion makers uh, that these reforms, these Uptonian reforms modified to fit with democratic culture uh, made, uh, made good sense. And eventually Root brought, uh, brought these about. But there were alternatives to Uptonianism. And these were in the guise of uh, a continued celebration of the volunteer tradition uh, in the American military. And one of the major proponents of this, uh, uh, this volunteer tradition was a guy named John A. Logan. He was a, an Illinois congressman before the Civil War. Uh, like many um, politicians and community leaders and businessmen and so forth, he, he joined up to serve his country during the, during the American Civil War, did very well, did at least as well as most West Pointers. Uh, made it all the way to Corps Command, which is just under the level of Army Command. And when uh, the commander of the Army of the Tennessee was killed at the Battle of Atlanta in 1864, uh, Logan was the senior Corps Commander and took over 
uh, the army for just a day or two because William T. Sherman, who commanded the three armies involved with the Atlanta campaign, was like, was just damned if he was going to have a, a non-West pointer in charge of an army. And so he tossed out Logan in favor of an arguably less competent uh, general instead. Logan never forgot this um, and never uh, forgave it. Uh, and eventually wrote a book called The Volunteer Soldier in America. Um, and this was a celebration of the volunteer soldier in America. And it was almost like the polar opposite of Upton's The Military Policy of the United States. Because what Logan argued was that the volunteer soldiers and volunteer officers were, the, you know, were responsible for all American victories. And the West Pointers you know, just sort of screwed things up. They were mediocrities. Uh, they, they proved it time and time again in bloody inconclusive uh, battles uh, in the American Civil War. And as for the good ones, um, Ulysses Grant, Robert E. Lee, even William T. Sherman, you know, they were good officers despite having been to, uh, you know, to West Point. That was the argument Lo that Logan made. Um, and this argument found uh, traction among uh, volunteer soldiers and officers who had served in the American Civil War, you know, were part of the volunteer tradition and, um, you know, and, and favored the volunteer uh, tradition. And one of the, the, the sort of the, the, the chief institutional means by which this volunteer tradition uh, was maintained was through something called the Grand Army of the Republic, which existed from 1866 to 1956. Uh, unlike the American Legion or the Veterans of Foreign Wars or other veterans or, of organizations, the Grand Army of the Republic was unique because the members of it uh, decreed very early on that the only members that were ever going to be part of the GAR were Civil War veterans because their idea was that their service was unique. Other soldiers might have fought uh, on behalf of the United States. The, the, the Union veterans of the American Civil War saved the United States, saved the American Republic. Their service was unique. So the organization went out of, out of existence in 1956 when the last Union veteran uh, passed away. Well, this veterans organization you know, included high-powered uh, politicians at all levels of government. And so they believed in the volunteer tradition. When they ran across Uptonianism, they were innately skeptical of it. When they saw Logan and others celebrate the volunteer tradition, you know, that was okay um, with them. And they became proponents of the National Guard. Now, this was a revamped uh, militia. Um, the militia had become almost moribund uh, in the decades after the War of 1812. You really had very, very few militia units of any consequence on the eve of the American Civil War. And so uh, although the volunteers that fought during the Civil War fought under the legal auspices of militia legislation, they really weren't militia at all. Well, after the American Civil War, um, Many proponents of this volunteer tradition created this revamped militia uh, called the National Guard, still exists uh, today. Now, there's a kind of a search for a mission on the part of the National Guard. Some of them saw themselves essentially as labor strike breakers, um, uh, governors in various states just who were suspicious of any kind of, um, of, of union formation or, or collective bargaining on the part of laborers, which somehow seemed un-American, you know, used uh, some National Guard forces to break up labor strikes, railroad strikes and others, sometimes uh, bloodily. There were other National Guard units that were basically, hey, we like wearing uniforms and getting together and mustering and so forth. And so, you know, they're, they had a strong sense of sort of corporate identity, but not a really strong idea of what they were actually going to do with, uh, with their force. But there were also members of the National Guard who were interested in being available to fight wars. And this was the type of National Guardsmen, that obviously, that the U.S. Army was most interested in. Uh, and uh, U.S. regular Army officers began to 
uh, to work with National Guard units to bring their training up to the standard of the U.S. Uh, Army insofar as possible. Um, and uh, Congress actually voted substantial funds uh, to National Guard units on condition that they trained to a particular standard that would ready them uh, for warfare uh, if necessary. So that's what's going on on the um, Army side of the House in terms of military reforms. On the Navy side, you get the birth of the new Navy, and this is a slow uh, birth, at least for the first decade after the Civil War. The time that the war ended, uh, the U.S. Navy was really the largest on Earth. It, you know, didn't have a lot of first-class warships, but it had a, had a good number of them. Many ships were designed for blockade duty. They were modified merchantmen and so on. But whether they were really good warships or not so good warships, they got scrapped, lots and lots of them, uh, after the end of the American Civil War. Um, and the American warships that survived as they sailed the oceans and so forth and made port um, you know, were like museum pieces. In fact, British officers boarding American warships were sort of like, you know, wondrous about the, you know, sort of the museum quality of these antiquated uh, American vessels. This begins to change in the early 1880s with the creation of what was called the ABCD Squadron, um, named for uh, four modern vessels. You see the photographs of them there. Um, from going clockwise, you've got the Atlanta, the Baltimore, the Chicago, and uh, a, uh, a dispatch vessel called the Dolphin, hence ABCD. This is a close-up of the USS Atlanta. Now, look, take a look at this thing. First of all, it's still got mass. It can still um, sail. It, it's not exclusively steam uh, powered. This saved on coal um, expenses you know, got uh, the Atlanta from point A to point B, but of course it's got two stacks um, to, to deal with um, the exhaust from uh, coal-fired uh, uh, burners. If you look at uh, the, the vessel uh, more closely, you'll see um, about, right, if you look, look at the, the back end of the mast, you'll see looks like two or three guns that are, that are arranged in a kind of a broadside uh, fashion. This, this, form, this, this way of, um, of, of deploying uh, artillery harkened back to the old days of the sailing nation, uh, sailing nations, but, uh, but were quickly replaced uh, by or augmented by turrets, uh, which we associate with warships now, but which harken back to the USS Monitor, the famous uh, uh, Union ironclad that fought uh, the epic duel against the, uh, the USS Merrimack, actually called the U uh, CSS Merrimack, also called the CSS Virginia, in March 1862. So, this is the beginnings of the modern uh, Navy. Now, this modern Navy was originally configured uh, as a way to augment the coastal defense of the United States. These were short range vessels designed to take on an enemy fleet as it approached American shores. It was not designed to extend uh, American uh, power over great uh, distances. What was responsible for uh, coastal defense policy remained um, land-based and remained in the hands of the Army. And this Coastal defense policy went back to the casemate forts of the post-revolutionary era. Fort McHenry in Baltimore Harbor, it's still there today, you can still go visit it. That was an example of this early casemate fort uh, tradition. And the casemate fort uh, survived into the Civil War era. This is a modern uh, reconstruction of Fort Pulaski which is at the mouth of the Savannah River. It sort of guards the harbor of Savannah, which is a river uh, port about 20 miles upstream from the, uh, uh, from the mouth of the river. And you know, looks pretty sturdy. Uh, very standard casemate fort, uh, 
very much like Fort McHenry and other, and other forts of that particular era. This is what it looked like uh, after a relatively brief bombardment by Union warships using modern naval artillery in 1862. You know, this signaled the end of the viability of the casemate fort system. And so in the 1880s, the Endicott board, named for the guy who was in charge of it, um, you know, met to consider you know, how do we revamp our coastal defense uh, system you know, to make it viable in the latter part of the 19th century in the face of what, what modern naval artillery can do. And what they came up with was modern coastal artillery, post Endicott uh, board. And what you're looking at here is a cannon, uh, obviously very large, very powerful. Um, and it's, this is in California. And what this thing could do would be, it's behind you know, very thick, um, you know, concrete that could resist artillery shell fire. It would, could retract below the level of this concrete barrier, um, be reloaded, and then be raised back above that, above that rampart just long enough to fire a shot, then back into the safety of behind the concrete uh, and so forth. Obviously a major improvement over what had gone before. Now, to move on to the Navy itself, um, one of the, the things that you got to bear in mind before you get to the Navy is this. During the post-Civil War era, the United States industrialized a lot. Prior to the American Civil War, you had one um, uh, industry that was, that was worth over a billion dollars, and that was the American railroad industry. But after the American Civil War, you were dealing with the steel industry, petroleum industry, um, meatpacking uh, industry, um, revamped shipping, and all kinds of other manufacturing, textile manufacturing, uh, for example. And the thing about these industries is they made a lot of stuff. Uh, and in the post-war era, the, uh, the gross domestic product of the United States quadrupled. Uh, and toward the end of the 1880s, the United States exported uh, more goods than it imported. And here was a problem. You know, American manufacturers were afraid that they were, that they were in a position where they were going to be making so much stuff that it was more than a domestic market could absorb. Uh, and so there was this, this sense that it was important to find new markets, extra continental uh, markets. Europe was one possibility, but Europe was industrialized, had a lot of manufacturing going on. And so one, uh, one area that uh, American businessmen identified as promising for the future was China. China was not industrialized, but it had a lot of people who needed a lot of stuff. Uh, and the idea of this, this China market was, um, highly attractive to American businessmen and hence to American policymakers. Um, and so this became an impetus to create a modern uh, Navy. Bethlehem Steel obviously had an interest in a modern Navy because the modern Navy was gonna be made of steel and they manufactured steel, but it went well beyond that because the only way you were gonna reach the China market and keep a hold of the China market in the face of European competition uh, was to have a Navy large enough to protect uh, American shipping as it crossed the Pacific uh, Ocean. This leads to the real birth of the new Navy conceptually first and then in terms of, of tangible achievement. And there are sort of two major figures involved with this birth of the new Navy intellectually. The first is Admiral Stephen B. Luce. I call him Mr. Inside, and I'll explain why in a moment. Luce um, became the first, uh, the first head, the first commandant of the Naval War College, which was created in the 18, uh, 1880s. And again, the fact that the Naval War College precedes the Army War College gives you an idea of how public support 
uh, political support for a modern Navy preceded the idea that the American Army also needed to be um, modernized. Well, Luce knew of um, a Navy captain, eventually became an admiral, but was a Navy captain at the time, uh, Alfred Thayer Mahan, who happened to be the son of a West Point instructor, Dennis Hart Mahan, famous guy uh, before the American Civil War, educated a number of uh, Civil War officers, including Robert E. Lee uh, and others. Mahan didn't go with the Army, obviously. He became a naval officer, not with, notwithstanding the fact that he hated sailing. Uh, and got seasick every time that he was, uh, he was on board a ship and became known mostly uh, for his writings, uh, particularly two books that he did on uh, naval power during the American Civil War. But Mahan was also interested in, um, in new, naval, uh, new, able, new ideas about naval uh, power that were emerging. Um, Mahan didn't invent these things, you know, out of, his, out of his own head, but he, he brought these ideas together in a way that was highly persuasive. I call him Mr. Outside. The thing about reform movements, and you will see this over and over again, is that there is an institutional player who works within the system, wants to reform the system, okay, but has to operate incrementally because he's constantly dealing with people who, who believe in the status quo and don't want to budge. Mr. Outside is the, pro the prophetic voice, the prophet, and Mahan was that. And the thing about the prophetic voice is that the prophetic voice, you know, can speak, you know, loudly and clearly and with no holds barred in favor of reform. And this can attract um, the support of Policymakers who are outside the sphere, in this case of, uh, of the U.S. Navy, opinion makers, businessmen, um, and so on. And Mahan was highly influential uh, in this respect. In 1890, he published a book called The, in the Influence of Sea Power Upon History. And a lot of it is a history of how the British Navy managed to make England or Great Britain uh, a world power. But honestly, you've only got to read the first 95 uh, pages of the book. The rest of it's just like, you know, it's, a, it's, it's ancient history or an old antiquated history of the British Navy. But the first 95 pages um, contain Mahan's conception of what modern sea power is about. Now, here we have obviously a map of mostly the Pacific. Uh, ocean, the United States on the eastern side, all the way to the west, uh, a country it's not marked, but just below the, where it says Asia, that's China. Okay. Uh, and Mahan argued that if you're going to have, be a modern sea power, the old American practice of commerce raiding, which went, went back to the Revolutionary War, uh, and the War of 1812 and other struggles, and that the Confederacy had used as its preferred naval strategy during the American Civil War, and which, by the way, uh, U.S. Navy captains actually thought was very effective um, and, and sort of admired what the Confederates had been able to, uh, to accomplish. Mahan was like, this commerce rating thing was nonsense. What you needed was something else entirely. What you needed was an understanding of how sea power was supposed to operate. The first thing was trade. You know, there's no point in having sea power if you don't have if you don't have anything to trade across the ocean. So you need to have merchant vessels who can carry uh, trade uh, across the ocean, and that's the second element. You need the ships to carry the trade. Then you need to have a force, a naval force, to protect the trade. All of this follows logically. Here's the thing that that made Mahan. Um, not unique, but made him a major reformer, because this is, this is his new idea, is you need a Navy that can command what he called the great common. Now, we don't have a lot of commons, um, so-called, uh, in the United States. But if you, if you think about the Oval, uh, the Oval is a great big grassy uh, area, but, you know, and there are sidewalks and so forth, but there's a lot of different ones, and the sidewalks are simply there to, um, because they follow the, 
the tracks that students most often make to get from one class to another. They're organized uh, you know, that way. And you can see that students, when they want to, sometimes you know, create their own tracks. Well, that's the oval in effect is you know, the great common of Ohio State University. Well, the oceans, Mahan argued, are the great common of the world. And what you needed was a Navy strong enough to command this great common. And how do you do that? When you create a, a, a Navy that is strong enough and powerful enough to take on an enemy fleet in a decisive battle, drive the enemy uh, fleet from the ocean so that it can only reemerge in a kind of a fugitive status. And that gives you command of this great common. So commerce rating is out, anything else is out. What, you know, what matters, and the only thing that matters is the creation of a major battle fleet. This is what made the Royal Navy great, its ability to, to take on other navies and defeat them in battle. This is what the United States needed if it ever expected to be a great power beyond the shores of the, uh, the United States. But that wasn't the end of Mahan's ideas of what you needed. The next things were what he called stations along the road, because these warships, as they sailed over the over the ocean, they, you know they they couldn't go indefinitely. From time to time, they had to put in to to uh, into coaling stations to to put more coal in their bunkers so that they could continue uh, the journeys. They needed to have uh, more food put on board. They needed other equipment to be put on board, and they then so there there needed to be uh, you know land land bases, islands in the Pacific, uh, that could function as these stations across uh, along the road. And you can see that uh, by 1898, the United States had acquired a number of these stations along the road. And one of the reasons that the United States eventually annexed the Philippine Islands, which we'll look at later on in the week, was because this was a, an important station along the road, a uh, jumping off point to actually reach China and the China market. And then finally, Mahan emphasized sea communications. He noticed that there were choke points um, around the world. Um, the, the Straits of Gibraltar, for instance, is a choke point, uh, a narrow point, 50 miles across, I think, you know, where all traffic in and out of the Mediterranean Sea, uh, you know, has to go. The British control um, uh, the Straits of Gibraltar, have done so since the um, 18th century, early 18th century, um, and that gives them a major advantage in that part of the world. Well, one thing that Mahan and others advocated was, you know, what we need is not so much a choke point, but an interior line um, that will help the United States naval power and maritime power get more quickly from the Atlantic Ocean to the Pacific Ocean. This was something that the British, the French, and others had thought about from time to time because up until um, the early 20th century, actually, if you wanted to get from the Atlantic uh, coast of the United States to the Pacific coast of the United States, there were one or two ways to do it. The first was to go all the way around Cape Horn at the southern extremity of, the so of South America. The other one was to put into port in Nicaragua, um, someplace like that, and then go overland. You leave the ship, you know, where that you came in, go overland uh, to a ship on the Pacific side and continue your journey. This worked okay in a cumbersome kind of fashion for passengers, but for the hauling of major freight, you know, real trade, uh, it was non-viable. So what you needed instead was the construction of a canal. The British, the French tried it, couldn't do it. You know, the United States um, got a hold of Panama, actually you know, sort of helped out a revolt against Colombia, which owned Panama until 1903, uh, in essence created Panama, and then made a deal along the lines of, hey, you know, nice country we created for you. How about if we bisect it with a, a major canal. The United States went directly to work. Panama is, you know, is, it's on an isthmus. Some of the, the, the land there is very high. Uh, but by 1914, the United States, one of the great engineering feats in, in world history, I would say, um, 
you know, created a canal that is still in use uh, today and that allows easy access from the Atlantic to the Pacific in the same way that the British and French cooperated to create the Suez Canal, which is also of major uh, world importance in terms of, uh, in terms of trade. So those are the six elements of Mahan, Mahanian uh, sea power. Well, to, to realize these, you know, this intellectual uh, vision required the actual the creation of, uh, you know, of a fleet that was able to, um, you know, to, to defeat uh, a rival uh, fleet. And this began to happen uh, in 1890, uh, called the Naval Act of 1890, it was sort of um, shepherded through Congress by a uh, very well known at the time Secretary of the Navy, one of the great secretaries of the Navy we have ever had, named Benjamin uh, Tracy. Uh, this Naval Act of 1890 uh, authorized the creation of a number of battleships. And these were battleships that were as good as any in the world. And they could take on uh, British warships of the same caliber. Um, and you'll notice that this, this is the USS Indiana, commissioned in 1895, began to be constructed, I want to say 1891, um, put to sea initially in 1893, but finally ready for action in 1891. And if you look at this, you can see that we're not dealing with sails anymore. This is steam driven entirely. And if you also look, you know, it's got, you know, it has um, turrets uh, fore and aft. These have you know, heavy caliber uh, artillery capable of firing a shell over a period of miles. And the shells were capable of piercing or destroying uh, an enemy warship. So, you know, here we have the beginnings of the modern Navy. This is a recognizably modern uh, American warship. Prior to um, the 1890s, the American Navy ranked, I want to say like 13th in the world. I would have to look it up, but it's something like 13th in the world, you know, just sort of a minor player. By the time that this naval expansion um, began to reach, not quite its apogee, but become well came well along by the time of the Spanish-American War, the American fleet ranked third uh, in the world. And by 1916, uh, you know, during the First World War, the American Navy actually overtook the Royal Navy, the British Navy, to become the largest uh, in the world. So there you have it from the military reforms of the 19th century. Aspirational in the case of the Army, with some progress, but uh, much to be done uh, as the 19th century turned to the 20th century and then the Navy, much more of a success story and much more, much farther along toward creating uh, a Navy um, able to handle the demands of the 20th century. 